This is episode four of Real Shift Radio with special guest Ruben Rojas. Are you ready for the shift? Are you ready for security, balance, and freedom to do the things that you want to do? It all starts with the shift. My name is Dominic Labriola. I'm a real estate broker and developer, and each week I sit down to speak with the most inspiring people in the real estate industry to bring you stories of shift, successes, challenges, aha moments, and overall best practices to help you live your best life. This is Real Shift Radio. Welcome back, shifters. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. It seemed fitting that Real Shift Radio launched last week during the week of Thanksgiving, a time to express gratitude for so many things we have to be thankful for. I enjoyed a very relaxing holiday and was able to reflect on all of the incredible blessings in my life. I also feel overjoyed to be able to bring you this program, and I'm so thankful for all of the support from my friends and family and all of my incredibly kind guests who have helped me to create this program for you. It's my mission to bring you inspiration through the people who inspire me the most in the real estate industry. And the responses I've gotten from the first few episodes have been incredible. It's so wonderful to hear that you are finding value in what we're creating with Real Shift Radio. Ruben Rojas is here with us for episode four in the Real Shift studios in Los Angeles. Ruben is a financial coach with deep roots in the real estate market. He's also an extremely active and engaged community organizer. I'm so thrilled to sit down with him to talk about all things, including his project, Beautify Earth. Ruben Rojas, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. (laughs) You are my financial coach, and we're really good friends. We met uh, about mm, a year plus ago through Mm -hmm. a mutual friend, Lewis Howes. Mm -hmm. So I just really want to thank you for coming on the show. And... We're going to get into some pretty deep stuff here, so okay. I hope to, uh, hope to learn a little bit more about you. So your background, if you could, please share a little bit more with our audience about how you got to be involved in the business that you're currently in, and actually, let's step back a little bit further and, and talk about how you started in mortgage lending. Mm. Mortgages. So, uh, how I got started. Basically, I was going to school. I was uh, on track to be pre-med. So, I got my bachelor's in exercise science. And I was looking at being an orthopedic surgeon. Throughout that time, I was actually personal training, going through college, getting myself through. And then one of my buddies said, hey, come try out loans. Give it a whirl. I'm like, sure, why not? And uh, walk in, interview, got sat down at a desk with the phone. They said, here, have at it. I have no idea what I'm doing. And all of a sudden, I made just under $17,000 my first month. (laughs) I'm like, this works. There's potential here. There goes med school. Sure. Uh, Obviously, there were some other things that uh, deterred me from going down that path, which is a completely different conversation. But... You know, month one was like about $17,000, and it was like $18,000, and it was $19,000, and all of a sudden you're making money that you're like, how is this even happening? Sure. Uh, and, and by doing good work, you know, at that time, mortgages and real estate was anyone that could fog a mirror and had a social qualified. So doing that for about a year... I end up thinking to myself, hey, I need to start my own business, my own practice, my own company. So I opened up my own mortgage shop. Uh, It was called Homeland Haven. And I ran that for about two years. And on that end, we started dabbling in some real estate. So I'm very much the type of person that specializes in one thing. So I was specializing in financing, mortgage financing, hard money, any capacity of financing within real estate. But a lot of my clients started to say, hey, why don't you sell my house or sell me a house? And I'm, you know, I wasn't going to give that up. And I'm like, okay, sure. You know, I'm licensed to do all of that. So I started doing a little bit of buying and selling of properties for my clients. But I was still very much focused on the mortgage side of the business. Mm-hmm. Um, and as we all know, you know, a couple years into that, 
everything starts going downhill. This was 2007, 2008? 7, 8, all of that. Uh, okay. I think it was a combination of both of those years. Okay. And what I started seeing and started seeing some trends was my clients were losing their houses. People were just losing everything. I mean, I lost 50% of my net worth just in the real estate that dropped in value. Yeah. Um, you know, at that time, I, I was young. I was in my early 20s. I had boats. I had houses. I had bikes. You name it, I had it. And I started unloading everything. I just sold houses, sold boats, sold the bikes, sold everything. And uh, really kind of used a lot of the cash that I had to, to, you know, pay for my employees and keep my overhead going because income was going down, I still had this responsibility to my staff Mm -hmm. to keep them fed. And I'm very much of that type where it's integrity. It's like, oh my God, these are my, they're like my family, my children, they took care of me. So spent a lot of money on that. And, you know, one thing led to another and, you know, taking out a lot of the details, obviously of the journey and this conversation to keep it quick, but, you know, unloading one house, Got up to about a million dollars in value, sold it for four seventy five. Yeah, so that's a five hundred thousand dollar haircut right there. Yeah, the good thing is I didn't have to pay taxes for a couple of years. <laughs> um, on top of that, bankruptcy. So filed bankruptcy was business bankruptcy, business debt. It was quick and easy. Literally got the attorney, put the paperwork together, showed up in court. They looked at it. Ten minutes later, I was out and it was dismissed. Because it was all legitimate of what was going on. It wasn't frivolous. It wasn't like I had a thousand TVs all over the place or something like that. Um, And all of that started leading to the path of where I am right now. Mm -hmm. Because during that mortgage boom and everything, I saw people still using their houses as credit cards. Yeah. And I'm like, what can I start doing differently? What can I teach my clients? What kind of things and responsibility with you know fiscal literacy can we start teaching them so they don't you know get into debt for fifty thousand dollars and then we're refinancing them to pay off the debt yeah so i started working with some other financial advisors doing some mortgage strategies doing some things that were really good worked very well which started leading me down the path of you know let me start looking at this financial advising field and and financial planning it's really more financial coaching um, that title is so convoluted as far as financial advising. I mean, there's people that only do investments. There's people that only do insurance. There's people that just do the plan, but they don't really implement anything. You know, I pretty much I do the whole entire plan. So I look at what's going on holistically, but it's really more so what's going on mentally and emotionally. Yeah. What's keeping you from paying yourself, protecting yourself, caring for yourself, caring for your family? Is it just because you think someone's trying to sell you something or is it because you just have other, you know, underlying factors there that are causing you to not go down that path? Yeah. And, you know, about a year in hiatus before I made the commitment and the switch, uh, I decided, yeah, you know, I'm going to go interview with a couple companies. You know, I've been with the same company I started with for over five years now. Mm-hmm. And... You know, I love what I do, and there's times where I don't love it so much because it's tough. It's like, you know, round hole, square peg. (laughs) It's sometimes it's just like you're talking to a wall. Uh, And what I find out the huge difference, the real, you know, the factor of what makes me different than other people is just asking those tough questions and really getting in and connecting with people and saying, look, what keeps you up at night? What are your pains? What are your concerns? What are your dreams? What are your aspirations? And then using all that now and say, you know what? These products, this planning, these tools are going to help you attain all of that. Yeah. And achieve that. So that's kind of the full circle path of, you know, millionaire in the mortgage age and then completely broke and now going back up. Mm-hmm. So... That's my rebuilding stages. Awesome. You you spoke about uh, living kind of more of a holistic life, and that's really the aim of this podcast is to help people live a balanced life and live their best life. So I'd really like to know, I mean, you're a CrossFit guy. You've been active, I'd assume, your whole life. But what's kind of a daily practice for you? What do you do to 
stay focused and stay kind of centered and grounded? Great question. Um, I live day by day. So the fact that I am a planner by nature with financial planner and all of that Mm -hmm. and just business minded, you know, I, I, you know, I live by vision and by end goal. Mm -hmm. But if I get lost in the details or really start getting buried, it makes it feel like that end goal or that vision is so unattainable. Mm -hmm. So I really go day by day, you know. Every day, I can't say I wake up at 5 a.m. every day, but I wake up at 5 a.m. two, three, four days out of the week. Okay. So more 6 a.m., I never sleep in past 8, even on a weekend. Mm-hmm. But how do I stay focused and grounded is, is number one is I wake up every morning and say, well, thank you. I'm, I'm alive again, and I have another day. Whereas I've heard it, and I've even been that guy where I wake up and I'm like, I just want to go back to sleep and <laughs> stay asleep, and I don't want it to be today yet. Yeah. So, so there's a difference in the shift of the mindset of I'm thankful to be alive. We don't know how much time we have on this planet, so we've got to live life urgently, mm-hmm. and we've got to live life with purpose. So what's my purpose? Well, how many people can I impact today? Whether it's through my career, which is financial coaching and all of that, or through some of my avenues of hobbies like CrossFit and teaching people to be healthier and caring more on that level Mm -hmm. or whether it's through my nonprofit beautify earth where i'm painting deteriorating walls with some amazing art and now people could walk by and say wow this is my community let me take pride in this so it's just a matter of step by step we always fall into the funk but just realize that look it's a new moment let me shift start over and go Mm -hmm. You've, uh, you've led the way for Beautify Earth. I'd really like you to get more into that organization and how you guys put that group together. And if you could share that with our audience and, mm-hmm. and tell us more about it. Um, so Beautify Earth is a nonprofit, and our goal is to paint a million walls. Beautify them with murals, with color, We've done a couple parks now. Awesome. Um, we've got a kids education program where we teach them to be responsible and find self-worth through art and creativity. Whereas maybe the world turned their back on them, but they can express themselves through art and be like, hey, take responsibility for what you just created. Now you bring worth. So that, that's one motion there. Mm-hmm. But, but the main gist of it is, you know, when is the last time you really looked at your surroundings when you drove to work. You know, most people don't even realize, oh wait, that's a brand new building that just went up. Sure. Because you're so in the zone, you're listening to Ryan Seacrest or Big Boy in the morning, and, or you're on the phone at the same time, and you don't realize like, whoa, wait, I'm at work already. How how did that 45 minute- It's like autopilot. Exactly. So, you know, I've realized that people need a big spectacle. They need something that's going to be in your face and wow you to reawaken your senses, to reawaken your spirit, your imagination, and what's possible. You know, when I drive, all I see is opportunity. <laughs> I see neglect. I see yeah. a lack of imagination. I mean, every building's beige, some form of beige. <laughs> You know, you can go with three levels of beige, and at least it's like, oh, well, that's cool. There's a tone, and it's fading. Mm-hmm. Like, do something. There is more that you can do there. And what we've realized is literally putting simple geometric shapes, a couple lines, changes everything. And it, it really creates a sense of pride and community. So people are now walking out on their streets and being like, wow, I live here. Yeah, This is amazing, and there's all this art around me. Mm-hmm. Businesses and the business owners that we've actually painted murals on have actually reported to us increased revenue. Wow. Like people are coming in just because they see the mural, they want to buy something. Amazing. Because it's like, well, you're taking pride in your community by giving up your wall. So it's not so much what we're doing, it's not so much the walls, and the, it's what's created on that. What's the social responsibility that's growing? How can we empower more people to do that? So we've got Beautify Earth at this, the whole is the, is the name of the company and the, and the nonprofit. But we've got Beautify Lincoln, Beautify Miami, Beautify Rockaway Beach, Beautify Brooklyn, Beautify Crenshaw, Beautify South Central, and so many more pending. Beautify Silver Lake. 
And how do we know that we can spread this around the world globally? It's really the, the message that we're delivering. Social responsibility, community pride, take action, be a leader. People call me, you know, hey, how do I do this? How do I get started? Oh, just do this. Literally, go find a wall. Here's some information, step-by-step -step guide. Every step of the way will guide you. But all of a sudden, you know, someone in Chicago started Beautify Chicago because they called me or called any of our organization and said, hey, I want to get started. My well, first thing you do is go find a wall. Then here's next steps. And that's kind of how that's spreading. Awesome. So, you know, my vision for that is really to have my phone ring within the next year or so to have someone fly us out to India or the Philippines and say, hey, I want you to redo this entire neighborhood. Awesome. So that, that's one thing. Um, a vision I had last year, a commitment I had was to be on TED Talks. So I've got that coming up, not awesome. on the main stage, but... We're there for breakout sessions, side sessions. We're going to be doing an interactive mural at TEDx Venice. Great. Um, where people that come to the conference are going to be able to actually get, dive right in into how this is created. And I got a really good experience going to happen there. So Awesome. Excited for that. When does that take place? That's in February. Okay. Yeah, it's coming up in 2015. Awesome. Yeah. Do you have a mantra that you live by? Do I have a mantra? That's a great question. Um, I mean, if you look at my Instagram, I've been doing like 100 days of art I and love words. It. And it's not 100 days in a row. That's where I tweaked it. It's just 100 days to get completed. Sure. And I do different sayings or different quotes. So all the time I have something different on there, whether I hear it from somebody else or if I create it on my own. Mm -hmm. So do I have a specific mantra that I follow? No. Do I follow the notion of all these things that are always working or, you know, stacks of everything else? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I've always believed in success comes from failure. Mm -hmm. So that's one of, I guess you can say that's a mantra. Every, every failure is really a success and gets you closer to that next success. Um, so never look at it as a failure. Number two would be that you make your moments you're responsible for everything. So no one's ever ready. You're never ready. If you're constantly having the conversation of, well, when I'm ready, I'm going to make it happen. Well, guess what? It's not going to be anytime soon. No. There's not going to be a like, hey, bud, you're ready now. Go for it. <laughs> no one's going to tell you this. So I, I've always lived by that. I've been very much the person that jumps off the cliff, makes his parachute on the way down. Mm -hmm. Trust me, many times I've crashed and burned. That parachute did not get completed. But many times it did, and I floated right down and landed perfectly. So, again, every failure leads to a success. So that's really one of the things that I try to follow and all that. And... Uh, Creativity, bringing creativity into everything, bringing artistry into everything. A lot of people think they're not artists or they're not creative. Every single person's creative. The way you make your eggs, if you put some veggies, some cheese, whatever, that's art right there if you really look at it. The mm -hmm. way you put your outfit together every morning when you get up, the way you sh tie, shirt, socks, shoes, you're being creative in what you're creating. You know, you might not think it is, or it might not be anything, you know, it might not be looking like a clown suit, but that's still a form of creativity. It's still mm -hmm. a form of expression. Everything you're doing, the way you do your hair. So little things like that, and you start letting people know that you're being creative in everything you're doing. They start taking like, okay, ownership in that. And they're like, maybe I am an artist. We're all artists. We're all athletes. Maybe you're not gifted at athletics like an NFL football player, but at, to one form or another, we're made to move. So go move, you know? And back to the, the, you're never ready. Biggest thing is people are like, oh, cool, you do CrossFit. That's amazing. You know, I could never do that. I mean, I have to go get in shape to do that. <laughs> Why do you have to go get in shape to do a training philosophy to put you in shape? <laughs> no, just do it. Sure. It's just a matter of doing it, you know? And fear is pretty much one of the things that I think limits a lot of people. Yeah. And... That's why. If you just say, F it, I'm going all in, you're going to make it happen. What have you been afraid of? Yeah. Failing. <laughs> Always afraid of failing. Um, 
uh, failed so many times. But at the same time, if you realize and take a moment and celebrate all your successes, mm -hmm. you'll realize one outweighs the other. It's not like you have a list of a thousand failures and only three successes. And it's also how you start measuring those successes. Yeah. So, so failure's always been a big thing. Um, and what's it going to look like? You know, that's another thing. It's yeah. like, is this going to be liked? How's this going to be looked out there? Is this going to be taken in the way I'm putting it out there? Like things like that, like being judged. So How have you detached two. yourself from that? Not judging myself in how it's going to look or how it's going to be or how it's going to feel. And in the fact that just taking the chance on the opportunity is moving forward. So why be afraid of moving forward? So you come across as a pillar of strength and, and somebody that has that marble statue look to them. But I've also seen a very vulnerable side of you. How have you tapped into that? And, and how do you let that come forward? Just leading with your heart. Get out of your head and just let it come out of you. Naturally, like it's supposed to. Um, and not worrying of what it looks like, not thinking about it, not analyzing it. But really, I know when I'm not in my head, mm -hmm. I'm completely in my heart, it's completely out and open. Yeah. What excites you and drives you every day? Impacting as many people as possible. Waking up and knowing that I can touch as many people as I put up myself in front of. Mm -hmm. Whether it's at a Starbucks, it's at my gym, it's in front of my clients, it's at the office, it's colleagues, whoever it is. Just knowing that I can sit there, put a smile on someone's face and change them. Mm -hmm. that, that's one of my big driving forces. And what I've realized in everything I've done in my life career-wise, whether it was personal training or mortgages and real estate, now financial planning, it's always been about people. So my passion's always been people, mm -hmm. and my vision is to inspire as many people as possible. Whether it's I'm inspiring to take financial control of mm -hmm. what's going on so they can protect their family, themselves, etc., or inspiring to take social responsibility via the murals we're doing, mm -hmm. or inspiring to get healthier because they see my commitment to my health. Yeah. So it takes a lot of people to achieve something like Beautify Earth, and to kind of get that, that juggernaut going, uh, how do you surround yourself with, and what kind of people do you surround yourself with to really help you with that vision? Very passionate and selfless people. People with a greater purpose to a vision that we've created that's bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. And knowing that it's not about I or me, but it's about we as a whole, and the mm -hmm. fact that we want to impact the world. And you can't do that with one person. No. I can't do it by myself. No, not at all. What about the people that you work with? What kind of people do you look for? As far as clients? Two aspects of that. First, clients. Um, well, I work by personal introduction and referrals. Okay. So... If I'm working with a client, typically I'm going to say, hey, one of the ways that I continue my career and make money is by being personally introduced to like-minded individuals like yourself, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And typically we end up with the same type of people growing and growing and moving forward. Mm -hmm. So I, I really do like to work with people that, number one, want to learn what we're talking about and really care about their family and care about more than just the numbers. Mm -hmm bigger purpose to what we're doing. Now, on the other side of that token, how about the people that you work with in your business that help you to create what you do for your clients? Um, some of those people are just agency resources. Mm -hmm. So agency provides us resources to, you know, planning specialists or investment specialists or things like that. So they're there for us for the best interest of us. But if I do, you know, team up or partner up with under individuals case by case basis mm -hmm. that go by the same thing it's like do I like you can I work with you and are you going to do right by my client mm -hmm. 
You know, what I don't want to do is work with people that only care about making money, commission, and getting it done however they want. So that's not going to work for me. No. What kind of tools or resources can you share with the audience that you've been using lately to help with personal productivity or even business productivity? I calendar everything. Okay. There is so much going on between my career, my organization, Beautify Earth, and anything that falls in between that, mm-hmm. that I let things fall through the cracks, you know? Birthdays, meetings, outside meetings, connections, climbing. I, I've just got, if it's not in my calendar... You don't take care of it. It'll most likely be forgotten because mm-hmm. there's too much going on. So to think that we can remember everything, you know, I do remember a lot and I used to remember a lot more, but there's <laughs> just, there's so much and you get distracted and you're, you're answering 32 different emails within the hour, a bunch of text messages and a couple phone calls. You're just like, what's going on? <laughs> Facebook messages, LinkedIn all messages. Of it, all <laughs> of it, exactly. So calendaring has been huge. Um, time blocking works too. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't live and die by it, but you know, I've got times where I need to just sit and dial mm-hmm. and I've got a time block it or it's really not going to happen. It'll happen sporadically. Yeah. Or I know that every night I'm going to the gym. That's mm-hmm. my time from five to seven, whatever between any of those hours is when I'm there, I'm training, I'm lifting and then I go home and that's it. Once I'm is home, that a seven me. day a week thing or is that? No, it's typically four days during the week, one on the weekend. Okay. kind of relationships have you forged that have been the most financially profitable for you? Um, In my business is working with more experienced producers. So if I'm working with a guy that's been in my business for 20 years, obviously he has an additional level of expertise Mm -hmm. or a way of doing something or he can see something that now, hey, what was going to be... uh, you know, XX case is now an XXXX case. Mm-hmm. So it's now doubled because we have more opportunity and more things to be able to help this client with. Sure. Or something like that. So so teaming up with the right people and experienced people. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of applies to everything, you know. We don't know everything and it's okay to say, I'll get back to you. Mm-hmm. People don't have a problem with that. They're like, oh, great. He's going to get me the right answer. And you're not assuming you know everything. Yeah. What kind of business has been the most rewarding for you and what kind of clients? Well, again, like I said earlier, I've always worked with people. So it's the people that I'm really connected with. Mm-hmm. It's beyond the service, the surface interactions. Mm-hmm. It's beyond the transactional business. You know, um, one of the things in the mortgage industry that I didn't like so much was like the mortgage is done. They're kind of gone unless they're coming back for a refinance. And it's like you're forgotten. You know how often, you know, you're in real estate. How often do people buy homes? You know, maybe they buy it, sit in it for five years and then they go to sell it. And did they forget you or remember you? Sure. To use you again. So it's really the way you make sure you're memorable and everything is remember everything. So get past the surface Mm -hmm. um get into the emotions get into the pains you know learn their name of their kids Mm -hmm. handwritten birthday cards thank you cards you know phone calls all that kind of stuff yeah something that i really feel connected to is a burning desire do you have something like that in your life that really is central to your focus I have a burning desire to be the best person I can be. Mm -hmm. So I know that the person I was yesterday is not the person that I am right now talking on this microphone. Mm -hmm. I know that the person I will be tomorrow will be a completely different person. And to make sure I'm always consistently moving forward. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, I know that that's going to directly affect my career I know that's going to directly affect what I'm doing with Beautify Earth. I know that'll directly affect my relationships. I know that'll directly affect my family. I know that if I'm constantly striving to be better, everything else is going to be better Mm -hmm. and move forward. So that's really my, my main focus on that. 
how do you measure that and and what makes you better each day great question um, because there's days where I feel like I went backwards and sure. went backwards maybe 30 steps. Uh-huh. How do I measure it? I, you know, take a moment and celebrate. That's one thing I don't do. So it's really focusing on, well, what did I do today that I didn't do yesterday and how can I celebrate in that? Mm-hmm. Or simple things like, did you go to the gym three days in a row? Celebrate. You made yourself better every day. You've improved. You got stronger. You got faster. You got healthier. Mm-hmm. Um, did you spend more quality time in your relationships? You know, did you have a conversation with your girlfriend, your significant other, Mm -hmm. your boyfriend, your husband, your children? And was that taking it to the next level? Did you follow up on a client, do something special for them? So I'll measure it in little things that I've done differently and in the level of procrastination I did or didn't do that day. What's one action step that our listeners can take one day to get them closer to achieving their desire? Leap of faith. Just jump. One action step is, what is that one thing that's keeping you up at night? Mm -hmm. What is that one thing that's in the back of your head just nagging you that makes you sick? Just check that off your list. Mm -hmm. However small or however big it is. Check that off your list. I guarantee the minute you check that off your list, you will feel this weight lifted off of you. You'll be like, well, that wasn't so bad. And you'll do it again. What do you see yourself doing and, and describe your life in the next couple of years? Hmm. Great question. So career wise, uh, definitely taking it to that next level and maybe even that skipping the next level and going to the level right after that. Mm -hmm. So let me just skip a whole level and go there and just consistently be that top of the table producer. And that just means I'm touching and helping that many people. Mm -hmm. And having that opportunity to be there. So that, that's one thing career-wise. Beautify Earth-wise is getting that phone call. I'm in the India or the Philippines or Brazil, and I'm painting a neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, half a million walls deep next couple mm-hmm. years, if not our full million walls. Mm-hmm. Um, relationship-wise, you know, I take it day by day, just knowing I'm on the right path. Mm-hmm. with the person that is my person. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just we are on the same path, whether we're married or have kids or all that, you know, I'm not tied to that result right now. It's mm-hmm. just knowing that this is my person. We're traveling this path together and we're supporting each other. We both have up and downs and definitely traveling with her. Mm-hmm. Um Family-wise, as far as, you know, mothers and brother, it's just, you know, keep that relationship and mm-hmm. nurture it and enjoy it because you never know what's going to happen with your family and your friends, too. And spending more time with friends. Like, wh- I've always been very social and I have multiple levels and circles of friends. Like, that's never been an issue. But sometimes that stretches you so thin. Like I've got my CrossFit circle and my immediate friend circle and my work friend circle and my other friend circle. Like it's like how do we commingle? And like the only time we really get everyone together is like a birthday. Mm-hmm. Like hey, it's my birthday. Let's all get there. Yeah. But it's like making sure that I, on top of everything that I'm doing, do spend that quality time with all these individuals that are dear to me, because if not, those relationships might strain a little. Mm-hmm. So it's really, you know, that too. So, and again, I said earlier, traveling, definitely more traveling. There is going to be a significant more amount of traveling. I have two regrets in life. One is not going away for school. I mm-hmm. stayed local. Yeah. I never left LA. And not traveling when I had literally F you money. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just there and I could have traveled. It's because I had to work and I had to make more. Yeah. You know, and I would satisfy myself and just go to weekend trips here and there and all over the place. But no, like literally I didn't take off to Europe for two weeks, which would have been fine. So that's my goals now is like, I'm going to Spain. I'm going to South America. I'm going Mm -hmm. to, you know, I'm going to make that happen. Yeah. So that's where I'm at there. How did the hardships that you experienced affect your relationships with your family and and how did you get through those um with my family it didn't really affect anything um 
with my relationship at the time, it didn't affect anything. Some friends, though, that you thought were really good friends, mm-hmm. you realized they weren't good friends. Mm. Um, because most of my friends didn't have the money that I made. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't a big deal to me. It wasn't like, I'm like, oh, let's go. I'll just use it. It's fine. Mm-hmm. I got it. Um, but sometimes when you went out and reached out for the assistance, they're like, well, I don't have anything. Right. I can't help you. I'm like, yeah. okay, but when I helped you. Mm-hmm. So that that's the one thing. Um, but other than that, there was no major strain or anything. It was mm-hmm. more my learning curve and what I needed to do to be really humbled, mm-hmm. um, grounded, and realize that, I mean, one of the biggest lessons I learned was we just consume and have stuff. Mm-hmm. Like we buy crap to show off mm-hmm. to people that we don't even like. Mm. right it's like i got this so i can show that person who i could care less about but i just want to show it off like it's what most people are doing so realizing that i don't need to have all that stuff that i used to buy Mm. you know it's like buy classic things buy things that last buy things that you need quality stuff Mm -hmm. don't buy trendy stuff no all that so that's one thing i did but i do all the lessons of what i did i mean of the ups and downs of owning a business, the ups and downs of bankruptcy, the ins and out of all that, having that happen through my 20s when I'm speaking to 30 and 40 year old business owners and mm-hmm. 50 year old business owners is like, I know your pain. I've had employees. I know mm-hmm. what that's like. I've been through bankruptcy. I've been through all of that. Luckily, I was able to bounce back. You know, credit's right back up to almost 800. Um, but how can that story now impact someone that I'm speaking to? How can Mm -hmm. I motivate them with the fact that I'm coming from this real place and this real pain that I experienced and saying, you can't afford that at 45 with kids in marriage. Mm. You don't want that to happen at 50, you know? You don't want to be in that position. And I've got some tools, opportunities, experience, and and ways to help you so you don't end up there. Mm -hmm. So that's where the story has helped me. So has it been a hindrance? No. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a couple of years where I didn't have a credit card. That was great. I don't need to waste everything on credit. I mean, people buy everything on credit nowadays. Yeah. And it's, it's the discipline of paying that off. So it was just the humbling effect that I don't need all this crap to validate me and who I am. Mm-hmm. I am who I am, and I don't need this diamond watch. Mm. Uh, and just using that story for my clients and for anyone I can speak to and impact and say, look, you can, I've been at the highest highs and the lowest lows. And one thing I tell people is like, we can all be rich. You'd be rich overnight. You know, you could rich in the mortgage boom, you could sell an app, whatever the case is, but overnight you can be broke. Mm -hmm. Look at some of these star athletes, Iverson, Latrell Sprewell, you know, made hundreds of millions and are dead broke. Mm -hmm. You know, because, again, they weren't humbled in the way that maybe I was or they didn't have the right advisors. Whatever the situation is, it doesn't matter. But those are things that can, you know, impact people. Those are ways that I can now, you know, shift the story. And maybe I can start talking to younger athletes and younger celebrities. Hey, let's do this, this and this because Mm -hmm. your career is only going to last so long. Guess what? I can make it so that you don't ever have to worry about money. Yeah. Then go do everything else you want to do. So for the people that are worried about money right now, what's the first step to changing and, and making that no longer a concern? Um, worried about money in which way, though? Uh, let's say worried about money because they have that mentality that I, I can't afford to invest in my, in my retirement or I can't afford to invest in health insurance or life insurance? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, it usually takes a little bit of more questioning to find out where is it that you're thinking that or what's going on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, some of my younger people that I talk to, it's like I've I've partied in my 20s. I know what that's like. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's not like I'm old or anything, but I know what it's like to go out Thursday, Friday, Saturday night and spend $200 a night. Mm Mm-hmm four weeks out of the month, 12 months out of the year. Starts adding up. And start adding up that money, and all of a sudden you're like, you do have money. Like, take 25 bucks out of each night. Yeah. It's $100 a month, or $75 a week. Yeah. That can add up. So it, it, it sometimes it comes down to, it's 
people want instant gratification. Mm -hmm. They need whatever it is that's inside of them saying, I need to fill this gap with something. Mm -hmm. You know, people like to say retail therapy and things like that. But it's just showing them that they do have the opportunity to do something. Mm -hmm. And just to start now. And start small. Do 25 bucks. Mm -hmm. 50 bucks. Start dumping it into a Roth IRA. Um, the conversation really becomes pay yourself first. Like, mm -hmm. who's paying you? Because if you don't pay you, no one's paying you. Mm. You earn a paycheck, but you're paying, you know, your BMW car payment. You're paying your rent. You're paying your shoes, your gym, your this, the, that. All of a sudden, you have zero money left at the end of the month, and you haven't paid yourself anything. Mm -hmm. So just know that you've got to pay yourself first and take responsibility for yourself. Mm. Is there anything that you feel like I've, I've missed or any words of wisdom that you can share? Life is now. Life is now. It's so easy to get into a rut. I mean, I get into them all the time. You know, I go up and down and just realize that. Look at the opportunity that we have here. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is still America and the American dream. You know, there's things. It's a little bit tougher here and there than what our parents had. But the, the opportunity to make anything and make yourself and be an overnight success is all there. Mm hmm don't limit yourself and don't hold yourself small. You're equal to anybody out there. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you coming to join me today. If our listeners want to connect with you, where's the best place? Uh, RubenRojas.com. Okay. Um, at Ruben Rojas on Twitter, at Ruben Rojas on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Facebook's backslash Ruben Rojas. All right. And BeautifyEarth.org is the organization for beautify earth awesome thank you and let's uh let's do this again i'd love to have another session where we talk more about really delving into the the financial components and um and kind of some of the things that we can have in everybody's business so mm -hmm. thank you you're very welcome dominic thank you for having me have a good day I want to say a very big thank you to my guest, Ruben Rojas, for sitting down with me and another big thank you to shifters out there for tuning in. As a reminder, you can connect with me on Instagram at Dial Dominic and let me know your thoughts on these episodes and more. For instance, who would you like to hear on Real Shift Radio? Reach out, let me know. You can leave me comments in iTunes and at the show's webpage, dialdominic.com slash four. There, you can also learn how to connect with each guest. Next week, I sit down with my friend and very special guest, Taylor Conroy, formerly a top producing real estate agent and realty company owner, turned social entrepreneur and founder of friend funding platform, Change Heroes, for another enlightening story of shift. Until then, keep it real.